Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Howard Marcus. Uh, we have a program, Claim Dirt Where You Can, the Rewilding Beyond Your Own, Your Own Yard. Uh, speaker is Leslie Pilgrim. Um, as host, we're the St. Croix Oak Savannah Chapter of Wild Ones Native Landscape. Hi. And Hi. If everyone can please mute. That'd be great. And, and have the video off. I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but please mute everybody. Um, again, I'm Howard Marcus. I'm a St. Croix Oak Savannah Wild Ones uh, co-president. Um, along with Roger Miller and Roger and I are both Ma Washington County Master Gardeners. Um, if you have a question for the speaker, please uh, send it to chat to everyone. If, there, if you have a problem with the Zoom, send the chat to the host. And again, please have your mute on and the video off. Um, the next page is, is Leslie's bio and program background a little bit. And then as a hint, over the last three years, I found that instead of me taking writing down notes, it's a lot easier for me to just take photos with my with my cell phone. So um, I'm going to switch to the next page just for a minute for everybody to kind of see Leslie's background. And if you're not familiar with Leslie and what she's been working on and, and who she's with. So I'll, I'll give it a minute and then I'll stop sharing the screen and Leslie can start uh, sharing her screen. And Leslie, you're on mute and you can start sharing your screen. All right, we on? Everybody see it? Yep, at least good. I can. All right, good. Well, hello everybody. My name is Leslie Pilgrim and I am Happy to be here this evening. I founded Neighborhood Greening in 2017. Um, I am a freelance writer. I've been doing that for decades. And yeah, I've always wanted to try to publish my own um, easing and tell stories of people who are doing things in their communities uh, to green their communities. So I started that with the um, wide-eyed notion that I'd get a thousand subscribers the first year again no cost easing um, and boy that thousand subscription took me three years so um, lesson learned but then there's something interesting about the cyber universe is that things start to speed up all on their own and so now I'm approaching a couple thousand subscribers from the east coast to the midwest midwest and southern Canada so um, that's been an interesting uh, experiment to see how the cyber world works. Um, anyways, neighborhood greening is, so I'm stuck here. Neighborhood greening, I can't move my, Oop. all right. Uh, neighborhood greening, I'm okay. Um, I'm, su I'm such a novice at this, so a little patience. Um, we published, like I said, the easing, the butterfly effect. And it's also, um, the web page is um, a resource page, um, a blog, um, updated quite frequently. And uh, it's interesting to see Google Analytics. I do get people coming to, to explore what's on neighborhood draining. So hopefully it'll keep growing in the future. Um, but tonight's program, is not about neighborhood greening, nor is it about wild ones. It's kind of about my journey uh, in the last decade, trying to get things done in my own local community, uh, claiming dirt where you can. Um, there's all kinds of places in our communities that have land that you just love to get your hands into, isn't there? Like churchyards, places of worship, schoolyards, city hall, roadsides. And so I started uh, pondering 
with the theme of only native plants, native vegetation. So that's the connection back to wild ones. Um, how you go about, about starting to claim space, spaces behind be, beyond your own yard. And so here's some of the possibilities that I'm sure we've all thought about. Um, schoolyards, places of worship, roadsides, public buildings, existing parks, municipal projects, vacant land, insert your imagination here. Uh, I should have put eco squatting on other people's land on that last two list too, because I've I've done that too. So um, and I've actually done projects, you name it, um, all these places I've done projects in our community. Um, and I'm just gonna share with you some of those projects and explain how I went about um, getting things started and stewarded and um, continuing on, that's the challenge is to keep these things going. Um, so here's the first one. This was a roadside one block away from my house that I would walk by all the time and complain about. Um, rip wrap, garbage, weeds, you name it. And I always wondered if we could do better. Um, and then I would scream, yell across the street to a neighbor and say, you know, look at the weeds today, look at the garbage today. And we kind of yell back and forth to each other, but we never did anything. We just complained a lot. Um, so then we learned that the city was gonna be doing, redoing this road. Um, and therein unlocked one of the interesting opportunities that I continue to work with the city to this day is road reconstruction I have found unlocks all kinds of opportunities. So the city never would have dreamed of doing anything with this half acre. It's really hard to give it perspective because it's a lot of land there. Um, I'm getting the message here. Maybe I'm not coming through very well. Let me just check something. Um, so anyways, this, uh, was a great opportunity in my mind to try to do something better with the road reconstruction. And when I approached City Hall, they had no idea what I was talking about. And so I won't go into all the grueling background of the challenges of getting <laughs> these projects done. Cause you know, I'm gonna show you photos. It's like before and after it's like, oh, well, that was, that's cool. That was easy, but it's like a lot of uh, blood, sweat and tears behind getting each and every one of these projects done, but the magic of it is once they become a thing um, and you get people behind it, then they're you know put in place for the future. So this is the before, and I don't even know why I took this picture because I didn't know what was a before. I just wanted a picture of this crummy roadside. And then uh, through, like I said, blood, sweat and tears, we did get the city. What I originally wanted was a rain garden at the bottom of this hill. Um, but that didn't work um, based on some infrastructure underground. And so we um, got this instead, which I think is better. So this is after it was graded and um, underneath the, um, you know, the blankets there is not, I wouldn't call it soil, it's dirt. It's the crappiest fill you, you could imagine, which is interestingly, you know, kind of what native, scruffy native plants of the prairie don't seem to mind too much. And so um, we actually, we, the city, we were ahead of the city. This was being graded. A friend and I went out and bought all this stuff. We ordered the seed from, um, we ordered a Mindot mix from uh, Shooting Star Native Seeds. And the city, you know, did lend a few a hand, they lent us a few public works people to help us with this. But this was really a community volunteer kind of, you know, harassing neighbors and whatnot to come in and help. So that was after. This is the, the end of the year, um, kind of when that first season, when things started to grow. Um, you see the, um, the one lone black-eyed Susan, right? That's what always comes up on these first initial years. Um, and then fade away in, in subsequent years. And then this is this year. So um, it's really quite fabulous. Um, and community really likes it. 
and it is thriving and it is a lot of work. So what we've got now is our community master gardeners um, actually have taken this on as an official project. So master gardeners traditionally, um, as Howard and Roger well know, um, they have to put in hours and traditionally they needed to be, um, you know, answer questions, tabling, um, but now, if you have a project, a restoration project, you can actually get your hours uh, working on restoration projects. And so the master gardeners have taken this on. Uh, they got it approved by Dakota County for, the, for their local program. And now this is an official project and they're out there quite a bit. Um, and it keeps getting better year after year. And the key to this long half acre strip um, thriving is density. So more plants, the more plants we can get in there, the less weeds. So we seed it every year, we collect seed and we've just been collecting it and re-putting it in every year. So, I mean, we of course bury in there is every heinous um, invasive you can think of. There's the Siberian elms. And if you look up here, that is, you know, buckthorn and Siberian elm. It is not nice stuff up there. So we have, um, no way to remove this and it ends up in here, but our, we're realizing that density is our friend. So this is, um, oh no, this is the best picture of all. So that was, this is the spring. So that kind of gives you a good idea of, of um, year six looks like. So I wanted to contrast with what I got going over here on the left. This is kind of a fascinating study of this half acre is cut in half. You know, you can see this is where the snowplow goes and this is pretty much where the salt and the sediment does not go. And so fascinatingly, we got two like parallel gardens going on here now. We've got the salt tolerance and the scrappy ones like the salt resilient we're finding is the world milkweed and little blue stem, stiff goldenrod, coreopsis, and the prairie clover is the big winner. They don't seem to mind the torture of being next to the road. And then on this side, we have more of the Joe Pie. I wrote the list here. We got Monarda, sunflowers, common milkweed, butterfly milkweed, the big blue stem. Big blue stem kind of are hovering on the non salty. Um, anyways, this has been a really interesting process. And People are very enthusiastic about this in our community. So um, this is a six, seven year, eight year journey from the beginning, but now it's um, quite a resource in our community. The master gardeners do actually do some educational programming there once in a while. Um, and so uh, a lot of learning going on in this one. Um, all these projects have been really nice for me because man, the learning curve has been incredible. Um, so this was burned the first couple seasons, which I really objected to because there's nowhere for these insects that we've invited in to go. Um, and I was not crazy about burning. And the city staff kind of liked burning, but um, she has compromised. And uh, one thing about all these stem cavities is they really just get messed with with the snow plow. So they're smashed up anyways. I'm, uh, there's a lot of insect life in here. So something's happening. Something's living. You know, there's duff and whatnot. Um, so despite this, again, harassment that this roadside gets. Things are figuring out how to live, but what we're doing now, oh yeah, we did find a rusty patch uh, just about every year once this, these flowers started um, coming into their own, we have found rusty patch there. Um, <clears throat> so this is what we're doing now to maintain this. So with all these projects, getting things started is great. Maintenance is the bugaboo. Um, you know, getting people to stay engaged and to these, there's no such thing as a maintenance-free garden as obviously everybody on this call knows. 
So what we do have uh, last year, we did this and we're gonna do it again this year, is I know we're sacrificing a lot of stem cavities. So perhaps we won't do this every year, we'll kind of rotate the way we, um, one year we actually hand cut these. Um, but it's really hard to hand cut in spring because everything's down to the ground and they're not, it's not standing up for us to just snip it. So it's kind of complicated. But anyways, we have land bridge ecological that we've hired, the city's hired a couple years in a row. And what they do is um, they bring, this isn't what they have, but something like this, it's a, it's a walk behind and it um, bails. And then they remove the bales and it's quite nifty. And the nice thing about this is that it can uh, you know, go in small spaces. This is as narrow as you think it is. And it's also um, lightweight. So it's not adding a whole lot of compaction to an already compacted situation. So we're really liking this as a solution for maintaining this roadside. So could we go and do this all over Mendota Heights? I don't think so, because it's a lot of work. Um, and I don't know, you know, we got the master gardeners who are really very devoted to this roadside. Um, could we replicate this all over the place? I, I don't think so. So that's um, interesting in that our current mayor would like to see, nice, you know, it's a good problem to have. She'd like to see this go on in other places, but it's tricky um, to make these successful. If we didn't manage this, it would be, you know, Siberian Elm in five years. So um, so the key is obviously, as we all know, is stewardship and maintenance and enthusiasm and um, continuity of these projects. So, so Leslie, to interrupt, uh, Roger Miller yeah. has his hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I can't, I'm doing something funky. Oh, no. Oh no, that's fine. Was it just oh, yeah, a, yeah. A, a quick question was, um, is this um, a city, a county, or a state road that you're working with? Very good question, because I'm going to get into that. This is a city road. So the city is gave us entree onto this strip of land, and they are offering some resources. So this, this little deal here every year costs, I think, about 650 to hire land bridge to do that. So, and they're paying for that. So um, this is a city road, but Roger, that's just an excellent question because about uh, parallel to this, parallel to this road, and just down the block is this road. Looks very much like this road, but this is a county road. And so I thought, oh, let's, let's take a look at this roadside. Um, and I called the city and I said, hey, can we do that all over again? And they said, hey, that's not our road. So this is a county road. So live and learn. I mean, all these roads, you've got county roads and you've got city roads and you've got DOT and you've got state. We've got Dodd Road, which is a state highway. Looks just like this road, but it's called a state highway. But this is a county road. And so I contacted Dakota County um and surprisingly they had never done anything like this before and the department of transportation for dakota county the fellow was willing to learn so i just thought this is way too easy um i'm so used to long-winded uh you know protracted <clears throat> discussions and months going by years going by but this one was really great because they came in and they did have to do a lot of uh, you know spraying there's every bad thing going on there but they sprayed it and then they did a couple different seed mixes one for the upland this is uh wet down here this is a you know stormwater feature um and he really um was very interested in learning and my so I should say in every project that I do, I have an ulterior motive. I mean, I want, I just don't want this to be something that I'm maintaining or whatever. I want it to be something more um, as an example. So I'm not ready for prime time on this one yet, but I would like to go back to the county again and um, have them consider an adopt a roadside native planting 
you know, um, program, just like adopt, you know, adopt a roadside to pick up litter. Well, why not adopt a roadside to do this kind of thing? So I've talked to some county folks and they like the idea, but I don't want to um, bring them back and tell them I'm feeling like this is a showstopper for them to, to look at. So what is, so good question. So what roadside dirt are you claiming? So we got the city and then now this is the county. And then um, they worked really hard on this. And then, so we had the Department of Transportation and then we have Public Works and they do not speak. Once again, live and learn. So the Department of Transportation got this whole thing going and I said, I shall maintain this. Um, and then Public Works came in and um, I can't, this doesn't do it justice how much they messed this up because these were seedlings that they mowed. I mean, everything, it, it, it all went away. So they, they mowed in the dirt, they mowed in the mud, and then they mowed everything just as it was starting to come and do its own. So that's what happens when transportation and public works don't communicate. But, you know, I, since then, they do communicate because they were all out there here last spring and you know i said this is what i'm doing again and um they both offered to help so they do i mean it's not a beautiful situation they're not communicating a lot but they're at least aware of each other now i was just stunned that department of transportation could put this in and then yet public works would just come and still do their regular thing uh, like it's a mode roadside anyways what i have learned is amazing so anyways so this is where it's at today. It's slowly coming back. It's not a masterpiece yet, but I can see the possibilities in a couple of years. And none of this, all of this just takes time. I mean, this this will be five years probably before I feel like bringing in county, the county in and saying, you know, what if we launched this program throughout the county when you had community groups that would be interested in maintaining, you know, adopt a roadside vegetation or whatever, what should we call it? Adopt a roadside native plant planting or something like that. But I do, I do feel like when it's ready that the county will be kind of interested because Dakota County has been surprisingly pleasant to work with. So, okay, that's, that's one project. So opportunity as it presents itself not this one was not road reconstruction. This is just kind of claiming dirt on a roadside that looked promising. The other one was totally due to road reconstruction because the city was willing to throw some money at that because on the other one, because they can wrap that money into the roadside project. So they did pay for the seed and they did reimburse me for, I spent a lot of money on supplies on my own, my neighbor and I did because we just wanted it to happen and the timing, we were ahead of their approval, but we knew we had to do it quickly. But then they did reimburse us and they were, they happily reimbursed us after the fact. So, okay, so here yeah. is- oh, Leslie, yeah, before yes, we move yes. on, I think Roger has a chat question for you. Chat, Roger. I have a question from the audience. Um, anything that might be done with signage? Um, signage, yes. Si okay. si signage, in a, I'm, I think many of us have seen some of that either put up by private property owners, no mow, or um, I think there are even patches along state highways yeah. where you that's know, noted. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that's done at the county level. Well, signage is such a bugaboo too. It's like, um, like I volunteer at the Naturescape in Minneapolis, the Nokomis Naturescape, city of Minneapolis will not let us put our signs up. Everybody's really squeamish about signs. So once this roadside becomes something that I want people to, I don't want people to notice this right now, but Dakota County has said, yes, we will get you a sign when you're ready. So yes to signage with the county. The city has been, oops, the city's been a little bit, um, uh, I don't know. Our public works guy doesn't like signage. We're working them over. We'll we'll get signage. So, but it's not like everybody's worried about continuity of signage. Does it look like a city sign? Does it look like a county sign? 
you know, what are you saying, blah, blah, blah. So um, yes, yes, I do know we do need to get signage, but it's coming. We have right here, we have a little box hanging on a phone pole. That's about what we've got right now, full of information about uh, native plants. That's what we got right now. Mm. And you know, some there's this stuff is complicated. We got people in here plucking out caterpillars and looking for eggs and all that. And you know, we create this habitat so that people don't do so we don't do that, right? We're trying to, as we wild ones all know, this is the best. Keep keep it outside and keep it in its natural environment. So we like to get some signs out there, like you know, the old fashioned leave only footprints. Actually, don't even not even footprints, but just leave it be, enjoy on the side of the road. Um, okay, so this is another uh, curb cut project, another opportunity having to do with road reconstruction. And so I, I'm offering some of these projects just as food for thought for all of you who um, would like to engage more deeply with your local county or your city or whatnot. And um, I just stumbled into all of this stuff. It's not like I had a master plan, but you can vision, envision things and then you uh, try to figure out, you know, how do you make it happen? Um, whose door do you knock on? Like Roger said, city, state, county, you know, uh, someone who has land in your neighborhood. So this one, this happened when I was going through my uh, Minnesota water steward program. We needed a project, my water steward buddy and I, and we had no money. Uh, my friend Marilyn Jones went through the water steward program with the MWMO of Minneapolis, where they had so much money for their project, they had to return some of it. Okay, well, I had, I naively thought, oh, we get money with the water steward program, but no, that's based on your local WMO and your, or your district. So ours had no money. So I had to beg, borrow and steal to find a project. So I went up to city hall and talked to said public works person again, the engineer who I talked to on that other roadside project. So then I knocked on his door again about what could we do Steve and I as water stewards for our project without any money. And he talked about road reconstruction. And so um, back and forth, talking back and forth, they had they have they have a line item, the city of Mendota Heights is a line item on their um, sewer, water sewer billing. I think it's $12 a month now. And that is for green infrastructure. So they had been billing that, but they I don't really know what they were doing with that accumulation of funds. And so one idea was to start a curb cut rain garden project in this neighborhood. So this was brand new and my water steward buddy and I door knocked with materials that we stole from the city of Maplewood. And they have 770 of these rain gardens up in Maplewood. And they were more than happy to let us steal. So we stole their brochure and changed some words and we we stole their garden designs. We've since done new garden designs, but we were on the fly, moving really fast, trying to keep up with this road project. And the first year, this year, we got, this initial year, we got 14 homeowners to sign up, which we were just thrilled at. And what we did is we had a meet and greet actually in, in this neighborhood in someone's home, because I don't like meeting, meeting at City Hall. It's not pleasant. So we had snacks and, and whatnot, and it was kind of a communal, um, you know, neighborly thing. And so ultimately only 11 could go in. Again, there's always these infrastructure problems, but um, so here is before, and what it's interesting now, this has become an annual thing. So now we, these curb cut rain gardens follow um, road reconstruction and road reconstruction is every year, every year, every year. So we just had a installation last week in another neighborhood of another 11 gardens. So now we have, we're up to maybe 35 curb cut rain gardens now. And the idea is, um, you know, keep going. It, it's interesting 
Um, it got legs this year on next door. Someone said, oh, I'm getting a free curb cut. I'm getting a free rain garden from the city. And it kind of went our version of viral in Mendota Heights on next door. I wasn't, so it was a neighbor that posted. So I didn't even have to door knock or anything. It kind of had its own life. So here's the before. And this is not that necessarily that house. How's that for a great before and after? It's not even the same home, but this is after. So this is more of a traditional, you know, we're not making people do native plants if they don't want to. I mean, the idea is be happy, um, like your garden. If we can get some natives in there, perfect. I would never recommend um, rose milkweed, swamp milkweed ever again in these things. They, it's just too dry. Um, they have all disappeared in all of our rain gardens. Just little asterisk there, comment for the people listening. Anyway, so the water comes in off the street here. You can't see it, but there's a little catch basin that needs to be cleaned out. Uh, we have since ditched the catch basins because people don't clean them out, even though they know they should. Um, so now the ones that we just installed this year um, don't have a catch basin. It's just inflow and outflow. And they're going to watch, city's going to watch if there are some rain gardens that have major um, runoff because of their particular street situation. They're going to put some catch basins in later. So. So this is just kind of fun to see. I mean, again, this was a huge process to go from this concept to get the city to say, yeah, let's do it to this actually happening. But again, that same master gardener group was all gung ho to help with this. And then there's a lot of other um, people in the community that I, I know where they are. I have their phone numbers and you know they show up and help. Um, it's kind of like a barn raising. My daughter had a um, little burly that she filled up with cookies and sodas and rode her bike around and it was gave it gave people refreshments. It was it was these things have to be fun. If they're not fun, nobody's ever gonna sign up to come back again. So here's a before. Um, and I think this next one is a true after. Yep. Oh, well, there's during. Um, and then there's after. So this particular neighbor loves their garden and they work really hard on it. So again, here you can see the little tiny catch basin. I mean, we've just kind of evolved. We're in year four now of this. So this was year one. Uh, the city of Egan has done a few of these. They said, try this catch basin. Um, again, we we realized they fill up just instantly, so. Um, so here's another before and an after. This is the garden I worked on. Um, and here's the volunteer crew. This is my daughter. This is another daughter. And, um, you know, we had about this many people actually showing up and to work on all 11 of these. So, but it was fun. Um, and what I do wearing my water steward hat now is I volunteer to go um, city environmental, ah, what's her title, director, I'll make, I'm making the title up, but she sends out an email or a letter and says, you know, our local water steward is willing to come and chat with you about your garden. She's going to show up on these weekends, these days, let me know if you want her to stop by and chit chat. And a lot of people take me up on that offer because um, they they just want to keep their gardens, you know, things to die or they need to be replaced. And they're very curious about what to buy and where to buy it. Um, so this one was all native plants. This is on the left, That's that was really scrappy, um, but it turned into something very nice. And there we go, volunteers galore. It takes, takes a village, but um, yeah, this was a this was a really good project this first year, and it went so smoothly. Again, I have to thank the water stewards. I mean, the well, the water stewards and the uh, master gardeners, because and again, the community members who there's a group of people who just keep showing up. I mean, it went pretty well. Clean water starts here, and okay, so 
before I go to the next one. So that was another opportunity with, with road reconstruction and these curb cut rain gardens are infinitely less expensive to do when you're just making it a part of the road, road project. So um, I consider this one of the best things that we've, that my city um, is doing and I don't think a whole lot of other communities are really doing this. I know Maplewood, Burnsville, um, maybe some others, but these curb cuts are really important because it takes the runoff from the street um, and catch, I clean these out. I have one garden that I'm working on and it's, it's really, there's so much bad stuff that comes in off the street. So these are good, good infrastructure. So the next one, the oh, next well, claiming dirt. Oh, Leslie, we have another Yes, question. Yes, sorry, I'm not doing good with the- No, shit. no, you're doing fine. Okay, okay. Question. Leslie, question from Marilyn Torkelson. What did you do with all the excess dirt from excavating the rain gardens? Oh, you know, the city, I, the city took care of that. Um, it, the, the contractor, I mean, it's engineered soil that get, gets put in there. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's an engineered rain garden. So there's a specific mix that's put back in. So it's not like you can just do a depression and call it a day, um, call it a rain garden. So good question, but I don't know. Are they, they haul, hauled it somewhere. So I didn't have to worry about that. So it is the contractor that's doing the road reconstruction is actually excavating these. It's all part of the contract that the city has with the contractor. So it's all rolled into that now. These are really expensive gardens, but again, when they're part of construction, it's just road construction, it's just so much easier to just roll them in with the whole project. Um, is there another question, Roger, that I should stop and answer? Or should I keep moving on? Nope, you're all set. All right, I'm good. Okay, hi, Marilyn, by the way. Okay. So this one is a schoolyard. Kind of looks scary and sad right there, but that's fall. Um, so schoolyard, claiming your schoolyard. So the DNR has a um, schoolyard uh, seedling program. So we get all we got all these seedlings for free from the DNR. Um, and I'll walk you through that process. The ultimate process. Um, the, the gold standard of, okay, what's the brass ring on this one is if you get your school district to designate this as an official forest, which means it's protected and the um, school board has signed off with the DNR that this shall remain intact. Um, otherwise it's a tree planting that, you know, future administrations or some future principal or whatever could say, I don't really like this forest, we're gonna get rid of it. But if it's protected um, by agreement, an agreement between the Minnesota DNR and the school district, then it gets to stay. And there is someone at the school that's working on, a, a parent who's working on that process right now. But um, this principal of this particular school, Mendota Elementary, which I went to this school when I was a kid, He's another very um, easygoing person who um, said, yeah, go, go try it, whatever, give it a try. So it's just like another one of these that was like, well, that was easy, but it's not always easy, but this one was easy. So not easy to install, not easy to maintain, but easy to get the sign off on let's do this thing. So, that is a lot of cages, but there are a lot of bunnies and boy, do they love these seedlings. But what I wanna do, if I can, this is so abstract, what I'm about to show you, I can't even, these pictures, you're just never gonna be able to follow because there's just so much change that's happened here. And this isn't even year one, but look at these little tree seedlings. They are tall, small, they are little sticks that you put in the ground. And the most amazing thing that I've observed with this project is how darn fast these seedlings dig in and grow. And I'm very confident that they catch up with much bigger trees that are planted, but, um, you know, traumatized from 
being roots being cut and not planted exactly the right way, but I will keep moving here. Okay, so this was year one, little teeny weeny trees, some we planted, potted, and these, you just can't see the sticks, they're all kind of invisible. But this is year one after an event. Um, we have, and then we went around the corner the next year and did another leg the next year. And again, these were volunteers from the school and having kids plant seedlings is like, so they're so not helpful. Um, I say that tongue in cheek because of course they have fun and they're out there and they're learning, but man, um, it's the whole undo and redo with little you know, little kids planting, but that goes with the territory. Um, even a lot of parents don't know how to plant these things too. Anyways, so this is year one, and then I have this in a square. So you can see over here, this is year two. So I didn't, you know, I'm documenting a little bit, but not realizing these are all going to be before and afters, and I'm going to be doing a presentation. So these are you know, the best things I could dig up to try to illustrate a story for tonight. But this is year two, so nothing's over there yet. And then now you can see all these ghostly chicken wire. That's all a little, we did red maple. And the thing about the DNR seedlings, and you got to take them in the bundles. So you get a hundred red maple, you know, love it or leave it, because that's the way they give it to you. Um, and hundred nanny berry. And then we bought some other seedlings from other sources so we'd have some kind of diversity. Uh, so that was the one problem is you kind of have, a, at least in the initial couple of years, you have a monoculture going. The theory was these red maple and these nanny berries can take a little shade. Uh, the red maples did not like it back there, but um, okay. And so this was all cardboarded. Believe it or not, what we did is we put down a big sheet of plastic. We, meaning me and a couple friends, not the school, um, big sheet of plastic and then cardboarded, like, can you imagine how much newspaper, grocery bags and cardboard we saved for this, but we did. And then the city, uh, Mendota Heights, gave us the mulch. They didn't spread it out, they dumped it. and to a mountain but they gave us the mulch so no cost no cost these tubes were donated and so no cost no cost on the seedlings um so it's a pretty nifty project that had very little cost um this quickly after three years of course all became very weedy so i have been spending time transplanting I know my yard is jumping worm free and we don't endorse, you know, sharing plants, but I um, have strawberries in here now. I have violets in here. I have golden ground cell. I have some ferns. So this is becoming a well uh, woven carpet, which is just taken off. And I wish I had a good picture of this, but imagine if you can, this is all now ground cover um, that is doing a really, uh, really good job of keeping out a lot of the weeds. Again, the Siberian elms always find, it's like, where are those Siberian elms? I don't see them around here, but you know, they figured out, but, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, okay, so then the next year, here we go. This is the other, this was the next year. So you can see we didn't really get the grass totally killed. And here you can see the sea of, um, you know, it, see, it's true. We really did collect all this stuff. Dumpster diving at the liquor store gives you a lot of cardboard. And then here the city gave us this again. There was more than just me and this grandma and her grandchild, but that particular picture doesn't show everybody. Anyways, look here. Okay, here's the little stick. This is what blows my mind. And again, everything's caged, rabbits, deer, you name it. Okay, so this was the true effort. And somebody, some mom in this 
volunteer group knew a brass band called the Arborators who came to serenade us. And it was a really sweet idea, but you can see everybody's standing around the Arborators, listening to the music, and here I am. Um, I just think this is the funniest picture. It's like, come on, get over here, people. So, I mean, this was like, I had one three hour chunk of time to get volunteers to do this. And you know, when you're a volunteer, you don't realize uh, how much needs to get done. Me, this is me stressing right here. Anyways, so we got these in and this side is uh, swamp white oak, um, red twig dogwood and the red twig dogwood are now so huge. I can't even believe it. The swamp white oak are really thriving. And we had a lot of, we had more diversity this time. We had um, hazelnut and we've got a variety of things over here. And it's interesting, these are two really different ecosystems. This is hot and dry, super hot and dry. And I'm so lucky that these two years that we did these plantings were rainy years. Like if we were doing this this year or last year, that probably would have been a fail. I don't have water for any of these projects. Um, that's another thing to keep in mind. That that roadside planting, I don't have water. Of course, the curb pit rain gardens and people watering their own, but uh, see how lush and green it is. It was a wet year, not wood. Um, so considering your water source, even fire hydrants, you know, if you have a fire hydrant nearby, you can get permission to, to use those. So, um, so that was, so see, these are just invisible here, little sticks. And then now this is, this is the stick. Uh, this is a swamp white oak now in year three. And this is a um, tamarack year three. I'm just blown away. And now you can see this is just all filled in. And now this is where you're not going to have any point of reference because you're going to think, what is she showing us? It doesn't look like before and after. But so this is in process on um, the first year planting when I've started planting, you know, some of the ground covers, violets that I snagged for my yard and uh, ground cell that I snagged for my yard. And now it's just taken off like wildfire in here. This is this year, uh, Perrin has made some Leopold benches, which are really fun. Um, and then this is a maple. This is a red maple, three-year-old red maple from a tiny, tiny seedling. I'm just, again, I love seedlings. Um, and then there is another vantage point, which you can't go from that to this. And I apologize profusely for that. But uh, the point is, is that these things are really growing. And for the schoolyard, um, so the educational aspect of it, so these are all native trees, except when a teacher decides to do a little project and put in a non-native tree and there it is one day, but that's fine. Um, these are all native trees. I'm working with a parent and she's so good with kids. So she's got hammocks hanging. Um, she's got little storyboard story trails in here. I weed whip a path through here. Again, sorry, so abstract to imagine this, but um, the first three years, this was the biggest stud. There was another parent who was doing these really great organic veggie gardens. She's just done a, an incredible job. And that was very popular because you grow food and it grows and then you eat it all in one season. This was a bunch of sticks um, that kids were not interested in being a part of. But now this just keeps getting better and better as these trees grow. And now kids really like kind of this secret garden thing back here. It really is very enjoyable. And this is my baby. I, I have to say I'm maintaining this thing, um, but it's, you know, it's my, it's my meditation. So I don't mind it. And I kind of like that nobody's, nobody knows what I'm doing in there. The principal's just great. He trusts me and I get to kind of do my thing. And then that parent is, kind of working on the, you know, the fun part, the hammocks, kids love those. 
um, she's trying to integrate learning, you know, trick the kids into learning things at the same time while they're enjoying running around. Um, but I love the whole schoolyard idea. And now the director of sustainability for District 197, she's very cool, very interested in this whole concept. And she wants to do, so it's the same thing, like, can we do these roadside plantings everywhere? And it's like, no, they're a lot of work, but um, we could pare things down. So she wants to do the schoolyard forest thing at another school. And I'm thinking, hmm, why don't we do soft landings instead? So what we're going to do at another schoolyard is plant a series of trees, you know, smallish, and then we're going to go big with the soft landings. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with soft land landings, but it's creating a soft landing under, you know, native trees so that um, Lepidoptera have uh, the ones that need to complete their life cycle below ground or in duff um, near the tree have, see this is cement here, they wouldn't do well here. So creating soft landings under these native trees so that the host tree invites in the leps and then those that need to complete their life cycles below ground have a soft landing. So we're going to actually do that at another school. Just kind of walk before we run on that. Um, so that's the schoolyard. And here's my last one, um, eco squatting on borrowed land. I say that one tongue in cheek. So this one is kind of the last three acres in this community. I'm gonna look at my time, I'm blathering on, okay. Um, I walked by this, uh, and it was full of milkweed uh, that were mowed at exactly the wrong time. And I just envisioned nothing but massacre. So I, nobody lives in this home now. This was built in 1940. But I did find the, an address on the Dakota County tax records. And I sent a letter to this homeowner who lives most of the time in Montana. And I sounded insane in this letter like you have a bunch of milkweed, I notice you mow at the wrong time. I can run around and collect caterpillars if you let me know when you're gonna mow or, um, yeah, crazy person. Uh, so I never heard back from them, which deserve it, you know, yes, that made total sense, don't respond to this crazy person. But six months later, I did get a phone call from this guy who owns this house. And he said, I got your letter, I'm back in town. Can you show me what you're talking about? So he actually walked this, you can't really still see the milkweed in this picture. Again, a before picture that I didn't know was a before. But in here are lots and lots of milkweed. And he, um, I told him the whole monarch migration story, monarchs are disappearing. You have a lot of milkweed. Could you let me, uh, you know, do a garden here, do something? And he went from zero to a hundred. He was like not knowing what the heck I was talking about. And by the end of this meeting, he's like, "Go oh, do what you want. Go for it." So I weed whacked an area where I thought the milkweed were densest because this is this is wettish down here. There's again. Um, some stormwater stuff going on down below. So it's usually kind of moist. So this is year one. Here's my milkweed. Um, again, so I'm showing you this because I think that people could be amenable to just letting, you know, you imagine something on their property. I never, I never ever would have thought this person would say yes to me. Um, and so that was the beginning. Um, and I did invest a little bit in plants out of my own money. But I did, you know, I did a lot of seeding. And this is all brome grass, thistle, everything bad you can imagine, of course. And there's nothing nice up here. Um, so I protect this greatly, this area. And so here's what happened when the milkweed had a little room to roam that came up like crazy. Um, they're not like that anymore because they like to be out on their own. Now I'm just learning how common milkweed roam. Um, 
here is the beginning of, well, not the beginning. This is probably third year. I've been doing this now for six years. Kind of all these projects just kind of all started around the same time. And this is the next year. And it's so funny, as we all know, these gardens of all, this garden doesn't look anything like this now because, you know, these guys have done their thing, they've gone away. Um, yeah, it's just fascinating to watch these plantings. They just have their own idea about who they're gonna be year after year after year. And this is now. So this is what I've got going here now. Um, so I'll just go backwards. So here we go from this to this, and here's kind of a close-up shot. So um, what blows me away about this one is this was just nothing weeds, and this is teeming with life. I It's just fascinating. How do things find it? It's full of gray tree frogs and you know lots of really good things in here. and. I'm just amazed at what life is in here when I walk around. So it's really quite fun. I, I'm not naive. I know that this is a million dollar property and it's going to be dug up someday. But each year that I'm able to have it do its thing, I feel like is a good thing. So, and also now what I'm doing is I am taking cuttings and going, okay, so down the road here is that road site that the Dakota County Public Works guys drove all over. It's just over, it's just a block away. So I haul, I'm gonna haul these. I've been hauling these now and just laying them over on the roadside to, to provide that seed source. So this feeds that other project. Um, and this gets a lot of attention. Um, People walk out and ask me, well, first of all, when they, people see me, they think I'm the owner and will I sell them the land? And then I make them listen to the monarch migration story. Um, and then I tell them I'm not the owner. So that's um, forced learning on that one. So that is part of my journey. I have, we've got a great project at a church. There's a church group just down the road who's just drunk the Kool-Aid on native plants. And they're just, um, just it's just kind of uh, it's catching on so people do things here's my theory people do things when they see other people doing things so native plants in our community Mendota Heights are starting to get oh I don't want to overstate it because we are still very manicured and still very fertilized and you name it herbicides and whatnot but you know I can see I can see the seed is slowly germinating here with the community. So the more of these kinds of things, and, and they need to be beautiful and they need to be well done because people will be quick to dismiss it if not. But anyways, that is, oh, and these are some of the things that have wandered in, morning cloak, tree frog. I don't know. If it's a, it's a, if it's a honeybee, never mind. And then here we go. Here's just a, a recent photo. Got the one monarch. I wish there were a hundred, but Anyways, that's my, that's just some of my projects and I could come back and do four more some other day. I could show you the, the church and the city hall. We put in a native garden up at city hall, but anyways, I shall end there because that's an hour and, oh, okay. So here's what I want to say about this experience. Um, mm, it's kind of like, there are so many moving parts to community. Like there's the county roadside, there's the city roadside, elected officials, there's, um, you've got your Dakota, you've got your county planning commissioners, you've got your elected soil and water folks who you don't even know who they are ever um, until you stumble onto something and you need them to authorize something. So I just wrote down like, um, Dakota County Commissioners, I've worked with everybody. So you have your local city parks and rec, you have your local city planning commissioners, you have your elected officials at your city. If you're lucky, you have a um, natural resources and sustainability commission, which you all should be working at to get in your local uh, communities. You have Dakota County planning commissioners, 
you have watersheds, you have the w, your local WMO, or maybe you have a, a watershed district. And I have found that the Soil and Water Conservation District, like the appointees, no, they're voted. They're voted in. You and I vote for these people. They're the ones on the backside of your ballot that you don't know who they are. But these local people are the ones you really need to get to know. I mean, they have local power. And I've actually got a um, soil and water to bring back a defunct um, uh, native tree seedling sale, annual sale. Like all conservation districts throughout the state have their annual sales except ours. So I called Dakota County Soil and Water and said, why don't we have it? And they said, well, we don't, but if you want it, you have to go in front of these people on a Zoom and explain to them why they should vote, vote it in. And um, uh, I have a friend here who is sitting just in case things blow up and smoke and I'm letting Carrie go. Thank you, Carrie. No <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, they voted, they voted to, well, it was really a public shaming session because I had a list of all the, lists are helpful. I had a list of all the soil and water conservation groups in the districts of the state that had these sales. And it was kind of like, we're the only one, but they, these elected officials had to vote it in. So um, I've just, again, been stunned at all the moving parts, all the commissions, all the elected officials, all the appointed officials, and each little group um, can help you or not with your project. So it's just, I think the biggest part of this journey is learning the system. Like I started just complaining um, and complaining like to myself and then complaining led to actually trying to figure out well, who has the power to make this thing happen. And then following those breadcrumbs and um, I even started by showing up at City Hall and speaking into the microphone. I thought, all I have to do is tell them. All I have to do is just speak into the microphone and say, you know, we're not doing this thing right. And boy, that did not work. So, I mean, it was a good start. It's, it's you know, gets people to realize there's an issue, but um, complaining or speaking in the microphone, um, Speaking of the microphone is effective if you are um, a group, if you have a plan, if you know how I'm moving parts, um, if you've done your homework. I, I, speaking of the microphone, I was asked so many questions and I was so naive, so ill prepared. Then I realized I need to know all the answers to all the questions um, in advance and anticipate the questions. Anyways, not to discourage people, but it's so worthwhile um, trying because there's so many angles to this, you know, as far as city land, county land, schoolyards, privately owned land, uh, places of worship. These are these are all places where there's lots of dirt to claim, um, and that's what I've got. Howard and Roger, I can I can answer questions or if there are any. Yeah, if any, yeah, we're a small enough group. If you wanna um, unmute and ask a question, this is a good time. But uh, Leslie, thank you very much. It was yeah. a very, very good program. I'm gonna, I'll just stop share then. And there we go. All right. Well, yeah. Anybody have any questions, then uh, please unmute and ask. Uh, Roger, you have uh, anything to add? No, this is Roger here. and. Um, wanted to alert audience members um, in the chat box. There's a link to information on soft landings, which Leslie referred to. Um, the So it's, uh, I think Heather may be in the audience, but it's um, uh, kind of an essay with visuals that Heather Holm um, has posted on uh, one of her websites. So there's a link there. And then uh, for anyone that if, if you, uh, you didn't get the note, um, we are with Leslie's permission, we are recording this evening's program. And within a few days, we'll have that up on YouTube. If you're on our Wild Ones chapter email list, um, watch for a note. We'll let you know when the email is up and give you a link. 
if you're not on our email list but want a link um, in the chat box, I've put my email. Um, so you can um, just send me the contact information and I'll for you and um, I'll copy you on uh, that message about getting the YouTube link up. It, it might take a week to 10 days. I, I have to get it to somebody else and they have to do it. So it, it won't be tomorrow. And um, Heather now has noted on the chat, um, there is um, information on soft landings on Leslie's website at Neighborhood Greening. And that link is also now in the chat. Thank you, Heather. So anybody with, with questions? Otherwise, would everybody thank Leslie and it was a, a very nice program. Thank well, you. Yeah, Leslie, I, I would invite you say a little bit more about um, where people can find um, the butterfly effect if they want to sign up for that. Um, yep. And anything else you might want to mention of the writings that you're doing? Um, neighborhoodgreening.org. And then up on the top, there's actually, you can just click on the butterfly effect. If you get onto my landing page, it's pretty easy to find the tab that will get you to the, and then once you click on that, there's a pop-up box and the bottom of every page, you can pretty much sign up for it. It's one of those annoying situations where you click on something and it's gonna pop up for you to subscribe. So can't really avoid it. Also, Leslie, Heather has a couple of questions in the chat. Right. Too. One about uh, retention, volunteer retention. Volunteer retention. And there's another one. Uh, well, one of the nice, well, I, I have lived in Mendota Heights for decades. Um, so I, I have, a, I have like my Rolodex of handy volunteers as I know Heather does. Um, you know, so they are the usual suspects and if they're having fun and if they know what the purpose is behind uh, what we're doing, they keep showing up. So we had that curb cut rain garden event last weekend and a huge master gardener group showed up. A huge neighborhood, you know, the usual suspects who volunteer, they showed up. We had such a barn raising again. And then um, what other group did we have show up? Oh, you know, now the city has started um, trying to promote volunteerism. So you can sign up on the city site too to be notified if there's a um, volunteer event. So that's just brand new, but a few people did show up because of that. So I hope that grows. So, but I do feel like fun needs to be a part of this community connection. Uh, drudgery is just, you know, people are spending time not getting compensated. There has to be, you know, an element of enjoyment to this whole thing. So I think that keeps people coming back. Um, you know, just take, take a break every once in a while, have a snack, share some stories. I just, uh, maybe knock wood, I'm just lucky right now, maybe people won't keep showing up, but we're a few years into this now and uh, we've been really fortunate with the volunteers. I do think that when it's in your own community, um, when we're a small town, so you, I think people like to communicate, contribute to things that are in their own backyard rather than volunteering for something, you know, clear across town. So I think there's an element of community to it. It's like, oh my goodness, I, some of the people who volunteered last weekend, it was like, we went to fifth grade together. We've known each other for decades. So there's some of that too. We're a small town in a, in a big metro area. Mendota Heights is one of those communities where it's only 12,000 people, but a lot of us have been here forever. So um, I just think, you know, trying to make things joyful and fun and communal is important to keep people coming back. We're good. Other other questions, other comments? You long-term management plan uh, after you have retired from such one. Long-term management plan. Um, that is always such a good thing to think about, isn't it? So uh, the curb cut rain gardens are 
homeowners are managing that. The city will, I, I have good faith that the city will keep being diligent and sending out letters about, hey, it's time to look at your garden and clean up, you know, debris from the winter or whatever. So it's a city homeowner kind of thing. Uh, whether or not I keep volunteering to go out and meet with people is not a make or break for that. It's just a nice kind of icing on the cake for people. Um, the roadside one really does depend on the master gardeners um, keeping that one, but you know, they're using that as a training. They get new training master gardeners and, you know, and each one teach one kind of thing. So that's become kind of a learning experience for the master gardeners. And then my roadside one for the county, I just want that to become a thing with the county. So that's my goal on that one, whether I have to keep maintaining that and then there's no future plan of that. My only goal is to, in addition to creating habitat, is to get the county interested in some kind of a roadside planting community initiative. Um, yeah, Washington County has adopt a rain garden um, of established gardens. I don't know if that's on people's properties. I would imagine that's on public properties. So that's, yeah, that's great. These adopt a garden, adopt a roadside, these adopt a things are pretty good. Um, and Leslie, Roger here, I just posted a link to that Washington County program on adopt a rain garden. Good. I well, should look at that. Washington County does good work. Let's see. <laughs> oh, Heather, let's see your question. How do you get things to happen when city staff have a limited bandwidth or level of interest? So, while well, you can answer that question, it's like, I don't know. Like, if there's a wall and the door slams shut, you kind of figure out what's the other way around the wall to the other side. I just, I'm, you know, you just have to keep running, right? Keep, if that person is a dead end, then you make friends with people on city council. I know you've tried all this, so I know, um, but but you just, you, you have to persevere. I mean, you're gonna get no's and roadblocks left and right. And then every once in a while you get a yes. Yeah, thank you. You get a yes. And then, and once in a while you get, like I said, some things just so easy, you scratch your head and wonder what's the catch that was too easy. So it goes from no, never, I, you know, I, I, I translate no, never in my head to mm, not today, maybe later. Um, the no, never was that roadside. The first one that I showed you with the riprap in it, that was a no, never. Um, and now that's become something really quite spectacular. So perseverance, which you know how to do, Heather, and just, you know, there's so many systems. There's your elected officials, there's community groups, there's, um, I have a, um, some at the county who really has been a great cheerleader for me. Um, and he's given me some really great ideas. He was someone who said to me early on, Leslie, when I was speaking to the microphone all on my own, and then they pat you on the head and say, thank you very much. Now go. Uh, this fellow said, Leslie, you need a group. Like, stop with the talking and the microphone all on your own. You got to go find a group. And so I spent a year drinking coffee with people in the community. I'd get leads on people in Mendota Heights. Someone would say, you should talk to this person because they're very, you know, interested in environmental issues and I'd meet with them. And so after a year of drinking coffee, um, you know, I did have, I did have a list of names who, you know, if there's some issue that would happen up at City Hall, it's like uh, we need to fill seats on at this particular meeting. So um, it's not easy, but you just have to, I think you just have to know what the system is. And then unfortunately, you know, sometimes it's the people who are employed at City Hall are your biggest um, challenges because they kind of hold and at least in my city, the public works engineer holds the keys to the kingdom and a lot of things um, that either happen or don't happen. And so 
we've been kind of working with him for eight, nine years now, and he's he's evolved. Um, so he go went started with hard nose on a lot of things, and he's the one who's greased the skids for the Kirk Cut Rain Garden program. So um, got lucky on that one. We also hired a um, a good uh, environmental technician, so she's she's helpful too. So yeah, unfortunately, some it's it's a combo, right? Elected officials, city staff, community interest. If you live in a community that could care less about this stuff, then that's hard. But it's kind of a witch's brew of different variables. Leslie, uh, a, 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 a shorter, a briefer kind of early days experience. This is Roger Miller um, that I'm having here with our township where the governance is more informal than with a city with full-time staff. Um, but just at a, a city council meeting, um, there was an opportunity for me to mention um, that there was grant money that the city of Afton and the city of Hugo had gotten recently for pollinator demonstration gardens. And the, the just the mention of money and grant seemed to capture enough interest that that then became an agenda item for the board at a future meeting. And especially these days with the ease with which you can connect with Zoom, it was very easy to get um, some of the conservation district people um, in front of the full yeah. board it, to talk a little bit about that. And yeah. that's now, there's now some planning going on for next season to put in a couple of demonstration gardens on around the community center, kind of the town hall. Yeah, so we just got, we got a 40,000 grant, uh, $40,000 grant from the Lons to Legumes Demonstration Garden Program. And we just, we just installed all those gardens. I think there were 20 of them. So again, I just feel like, um, you know, like with the butterfly effect where my expectation of a thousand the first year was, you know, ridiculous. And then somewhere along the line, you hit a critical mass and then things start to um, happen more quickly. And I feel like if we've got these curb cut rain gardens and we've got these 20 new demonstration um, lawns to legumes gardens and we keep doing the curb cuts and we've got these roadsides, I just feel like at some point, again, this is Pollyanna-ish, but at some point, these things start to get noticed and there just seems to be a little loosening in our community. Um, I noticed there's a few more native gardens in people's front yards. It's just just a little, but man, that's a lot different than a decade ago. So yeah, and money is helpful, Roger. And there's grants though, that demonstration garden grant. Uh, we went through Metro Blooms uh, to help us do all of the coordinating on that because we did not have the city staff to be able to um, manage that. And so Metro Blooms met with all the homeowners. They did individual designs for the homeowners. So it wasn't cookie cutter. And they integrated it in with whatever might already be going on in the front yard. It's gotta be a front yard because it's a demonstration garden. So you have to see it. And then Metro Blooms prepped, prepped the grass and dug it up and um, they were good to work with. That was that was a good project to outsource to Metro Blooms because again, when I mentioned this demonstration grant to our city staff, her eyes glazed over like, I there's just no way in the world I could ever do this. And then I'd mentioned that Metro Blooms would be a good subcontractor. And so that, that worked well. Roger again here, um, also one of the lead-ins that seems to have worked within the township um, I discovered one of the township board members um, was interested in getting a local grant in converting turf grass into um, pollinator habitat on his own property and had learned enough about that so that when he realized the same kind of process 
could go on for the township. Um, he became kind of a champion. And so he was the one within the township board that was suggesting we investigated further and set up a, um, an agenda discussion, et cetera. Um, so that opened the door very nicely. Yeah. Yeah, money helps. Um, let's see, I'm looking through, how did you connect with the master gardeners? Oh, well, I just knew one of them. Um, so that's not a helpful answer, sorry. Um, yeah, I think I got, I think that's all the questions, don't you, Roger? Yeah, I, this is Howard. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. Do uh, do other people have any questions? It's it's getting late, and Leslie's been very generous with her time, but I'm sure I'm sure she can answer a question or two more if people have questions. Contact me too if you want to know. You know, where'd you find this person for the schoolyard? I can't find the schoolyard information on the DNR site. If you if, feel free to email me on Neighborhood Greening, I have an email link there. Well, Leslie, you've been great. Really appreciate it. And um, we'll get the recording out as soon as we can. It'll take a little bit. Uh, but I want to thank everybody for attending. And and um, we'll have more programs coming I maybe October, maybe starting in January. But we'll, we'll, we'll keep going with the programs as soon as, as best we can. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie.